Hi, I'm Dave Boyd with the Potter Shop Hollow Tree Farm and Portable Hydraulic Sawmill. This video takes you through the process of adding hydraulics and a wireless remote to a Norwood HD36 or HD38 Max sawmill. I'll show you how to set up the auxiliary hydraulic power system, install hydraulic tow rollers, bog turner, bog stops and clamps, log lifter, power feed, and the wireless remote. So let's get started. Set the power unit on the cross brace. It'll balance there, but it'd be a good idea to have a second person help set it in place and hold it while you bolt it down. We will drop in a couple of bolts. The angle bracket goes on the bottom side. Put the nuts on both sides, finger tight. And then slide it on the cross beam so that the side of the reservoir is about seven inches from the frame. Tighten both sides of the bracket evenly so the unit sits flat on the cross brace. Put on the valve bracket, just these three bolts need to come out. Insert the three long bolts and secure them to the sawmill frame with the serrated flange nuts. putting these holding nuts on backwards so that the flange on the nut will be against the metal plate on the valves. And the instructions call for an inch and three-eighths spacing and you want to get them all the same. There we go. The valve unit attaches to the three long bolts tight against those spacer nuts. is to get this whole assembly mounted outwards a little bit so it's not right up against the frame. And in fact, I've got, I am guessing, quarter of an inch, maybe, of uh, space between the mounting plate and the frame. And it's uh, mounted quite solidly. So we'll move on. Now for the hoses. This hose connects the output from the hydraulic pump to the high pressure side of the valve system manifold. And the good quality hoses with nice swivels on them that work real nicely. There we go. Now we can come in. Thread on.
The other hose is a low pressure return line from the valve manifold to the reservoir. A rubber o-ring seals the hose to the fitting, so you want a firm but not killer tight connection. That was a good tight fit. Good. Start out the tow roller assembly by running the axle through the bracket and the rollers, and put a cotter pin on both ends to hold the axle in place. I've noticed that the holes in the spacer bars are just a little off center and they will bind up that slider unless you put the edge with the holes closer to it toward the inside. If you look carefully, you can see the difference, but I put a mic on it just to be sure. 165 thousandths on this side and it looks like about 171 thousandths on the other side. That six thousandths of an inch can make the difference between a bound up tow roller and one that slides easily. And of course, you should check the other spacer as well. It's easiest to line everything up if you put the four shims on top of the spacer bars. Then install the bolts. Needle nose pliers are helpful in lining up the holes. After everything is tightened down, the tow roller should slide easily in the housing. Okay, might as well put on the hydraulic cylinder. And when you do, make sure that the base of the cylinder attaches to the frame and the sliding part attaches to the rollers. The roller assembly mounts right onto the cross bunks. Hold the bolt heads with a wrench to keep them from backing out when you tighten down the nuts. I so we'll pull out the plugs. And put in the adapters. And attach the hydraulic lines. And uh, it should be pretty much at a right angle, maybe the bottom one, maybe just slightly up. There. There we go. Those will run along the inside of the ring. Connecting the lines from the base or the bottom of the cylinder to the top valve port will extend the cylinder when you lift or push forward on the lever. I put zip ties on both ends of the lines attached to the base of the cylinders to keep them straight.
Finger tight for now. You may need to reroute the lines as you add other hydraulic components. Well, I have found that sometimes the bolts don't go in the shreds on the brackets really easily. And that's particularly important on this bracket, which is for the log turner, because two of the bolts have to go in from the inside, and they're hard to get to. And it might be just because it was galvanized after the holes were tapped, or a little bit of distortion from, of the threads from the uh, welding process. So this is a good time to make sure that you can go ahead and thread the bolt in and back out again all the way, just with your fingers. And that one was good. Let's try this one. That's pretty tight. I can't thread it by, by hand. So that's a good candidate to come back out and use the tap to clean out those threads. And there's no quick, easy way to do it. Uh, just about have to put a 5 16th wrench on the tap and do it this way. Let's try it again, see if it's any better this time. Okay, now we are ready to install the log turner brackets. Instructions call for these bolts to thread in from the inside out. And there's not a whole lot of room to get your fingers. And this is why I was really particular about getting these threads tapped out to make sure those bolts go in easily. A little awkward, but yeah, it can be done. So the way this is supposed to work is when the log turner is turning the log, it's actually pushing the frame against those bolt heads, and that holds everything in place. Set the arm in the bracket and slide the axle so it can pivot. A lock collar goes on both ends of the axle. The arm should be able to pivot freely. Attach the bottom of the cylinder to the bracket. and the top of the piston to the pivot arm. There we go. Set the chain on the log turner, making sure that the teeth on the top side point up. Install the master link.
and secure it with the two small cotter pins. Stay put. Loosen the lock nuts on the chain tensioner. And adjust the tensioner on both sides so that the chain has just a little slack in it. Then tighten down the lock nuts and side bolts to hold it in place. And then we're ready to do our hosts. Install the hose fittings and the hoses to the hydraulic turner. Drop the hoses back to the valves so that they'll be out of the way and not scrape the ground when you move the sawmill. Then attach the hoses to the lift cylinder. Since this retracts to raise the turner and extends to lower it, I connected it to retract the piston when I lift the lever. Alright, so there are the hydraulic lines to the log turner. Finally, connect the hydraulic lines to the valves. Again, finger tight for now. The clamp has to slide both side to side and up and down. It comes partly assembled, but you'll need to take the top plate off and install the sliding cylinder attach arm and the cross slide. Again, when you reassemble the bracket, make sure that the spacer is turned to give as much inside clearance as possible. Make sure you remember the shims. There should be one on each side. The cylinder attach arm, though, can only go on one way. Line up the mounting holes and carefully set the cross slide rail back in place. It helps to support the cross slide with a couple of pieces of wood. Then replace the top plate and bolt it in place. If everything fits properly, you should be able to slide the clamp on the cross slide rail easily. Smooth as silk. Perfect. So now it's ready to mount in place. Tighten down all the bolts on the clamp lift bracket and make sure the lift slides smoothly. If it's bound up tight like this one, disassemble it and turn the spacers around so that the holes are closer to the inside of the bracket.
This will give you enough clearance that the clamp should slide freely when all the bolts are tightened down. Now it's ready to attach to the mill. Log rest brackets bolt to the non-operator side of the cross bunk, like this. Slip in the log rest and attach the hydraulic cylinder. The cylinder pulls the clamp against the wood, so make sure you have this tab on the non-operator's side. The cross slide for the clamp is heavy and awkward, but there is an easy way to bolt it in place. I've got a support that's about four inches lower than the track, so it's supported while I bolt the other side of the frame. Then hold it up while I bolt this side. Piece of cake. Of course, it's even easier if you have a friend who can help you. The clamp just slides right into the bracket, and the lift cylinder attaches to the clamp. That's all you need. The bolt is just snug against the piston flange. Attach the cross slide cylinder. And for now, to keep it out of the way, I'm going to hold it up with a zip tie. Put on the angle fittings here. Well, hopefully that'll get it close. Then attach the hoses to the lift cylinder. I found it works best to run these hoses along the operator's side of the frame. Then attach the two hydraulic hoses to the valve. Attach the hoses to the cross slide cylinder. That should get it. Then run them back along the non operator side to the valves. There. 
A flow divider keeps both log rest cylinders at the same height as they raise and lower. It's easiest if you clamp the flow divider housing in a vise to install the fittings. Your flow control is here. Got a plug here. And then your line input on this side. And your two outputs on the other. The flow divider and T should both mount on the non-operator side of the sawmill frame. Attach a hydraulic hose to the input side of the flow divider. Then attach the output lines to the lower hydraulic cylinder fittings. Finger tight, we'll let it pivot for now until we get our hoses lined out. The center of the T connects to the lower side of the hydraulic valve control with a 90 degree fitting. The two ends at the top of the T connect to the tops of the log rest cylinders. Kind of like that. Once you have all the hoses where they need to be, tighten both ends down to their respective fittings. The flow divider and T should fit neatly inside the rail. Finally, connect the hoses to their valve fittings. And that's it. The rear bracket for the log lifter is going to attach to bolt holes number 26 and 27 on the frame. So first thing we'll do is get those bolts out. So these bolts space the bracket out by the same distance as these uh, corrugations in the frame. So that will give it a little more support. And we'll just make sure they're snug. Make sure the bracket goes on right side up. Same as the other. So we're going to do the last thing first. which is to pin the bracket in place. Oh yeah, that's much easier. That just holds everything in place while you're working on it. Okay. Now we'll do a little flippy arm thing. Okay. 
Pimp the bottom. Stuff it down, pin it to the top. Stop in our pins and As they say in French, voila! Goes in. This way. There we go. Slide that in. You got a little slide in about there. And we'll bring them together. We'll make sure that that steel tubing is butted up against itself there. There we go. And we'll slide it so there's about as much overhang on each side as the other. And we want that bar sticking out oh, about two and a half inches uh, from each end. We'd pretty well have her centered. You only need one hydraulic line for the log lifter since gravity will pull it back down after you've loaded the log. And you see I've got the hoses tucked well back out of the way. Lots of zip ties and you can see some of them here. And the idea is no hoses are, le are sagging. Nothing close to the ground that's going to catch when you move the sawmill. and everything is bundled together. Okay, we have all of the hydraulic hoses run and we have a lot of tightening down to do. We need to tighten both ends of all of the hoses, make sure we don't have any leaks. And I'll start out with all of the top fittings. I know I've already tightened down the hoses to the hydraulic pump, so those are good. Alright, now we'll come in and do the ones underneath. There, okay. So, all of these fittings to the valves are tightened down, and I'm just going to go back and tighten down all of the fittings to the cylinders. We'll do that, and then we'll be ready to check it out. Now we're ready to start the power feed, and we have to put the brackets on that hold the chain, and the first one goes on the on operator side towards the front that fits in about like this a little awkward but it can be done there now we'll do the bracket on the other end
All right, so there are our anchor points for the chain. Remove the four bolts holding the upright post on the non-operator's side. And mount the feed motor. The chain bolts go on the anchor brackets. I added a second jam nut to secure it in place. Then attach the chain to the bolt with the master link. Just do one end for now. Here we have it. Remove the gear cover plate. Wrap the chain over the drive gear and under the two idler gears. So that's how the chain goes. Then replace the cover plate. Then attach the other end of the drive chain to the front bracket. That probably won't be too far off. Snug it down. And you do want that chain. You don't want any twist in that chain. It needs to float straight up and down. That should get it. To install the wireless remote, start out by removing the throttle lever from the push handle. If you're upgrading to an HD36, you also need to replace the winch shaft and install a lift motor. To see how to do that, check out the video Assembling the HD38 Saw Head and Carriage. Okay, this is the actuator. That moves this arm in and out, which controls the throttle and the water. And it's got to come off. So the remote control unit place right here. But it doesn't go on tight because as this actuator works, it has to pivot up and down just a little bit. We can uh, take some of the slack out of here. There we go. And that should work. There's not a lot of pressure on it. This video shows the installation for the Honda engine upgrade, which controls the throttle with the switch. If you have the Briggs & Stratton Vanguard, the remote will control the throttle with the cable linkage. Now, we'll see if that works. The cables for the battery connection, winch lift, and power feed connect to the control box. Well. I mounted the power feed electric line a little higher across the top to make sure it doesn't snag on a log. And I mounted the control box with the cable connections on top to get all the cables to reach when the saw head is in the pull-up position.
Now there's plenty of slack for the carriage feed cable to reach the motor connection. Match the connectors by color and use a zip tie to hold the cable in place. Connect the throttle actuator to the remote control unit. Again, matching the wires red to red and black to black. Tighten it down. The manual has a couple of pages on using the wireless remote and I recommend you read up on it. Here's what I consider to be some of the most important points. These screws do fall out so if you're doing it out in the field be careful. You've got a magnet on the back of it so take advantage of that and don't lose your screws. On the battery, the positive end has a smaller amount of metal exposed on the end. Negative, which is marked on this battery, the larger amount is called a flat top, and that's handy to know. Positive here, negative here, it's marked on the circuit board. So we'll turn it around the way it's supposed to be. Use the zip tie. There. Now that zip tie will hold it in place and you've got to have some way to keep that battery in because you will drop it or it will fall off the holder and hit the ground and if it becomes dislodged from the holder you got to take the whole thing apart, put it back together, uh, rinse and repeat. You're going to want a pair of snips in your toolbox because eventually you will need to replace your battery and when you do uh, you'll have to cut the zip tie out and put in another so you'll need some extra zip ties in your toolbox I always carry extras anyway we'll just go ahead and cut it off short and swing that tie around out of the way and you're good to go another option are these pipe cleaners and you could use those in place of the zip tie. I have a bunch of them in my toolbox anyway because I use them to identify my bandsaw blade. So whichever way you do it, you got to have some way to tie that battery down. Okay, now ready to put her back together. Make sure that ribbon goes inside. Everything lined up. Now, before you use it on the mill, you want to charge it up. And I recommend just use the USB charger that came with it. It just plugs in right here. The other end goes to a cell phone charging unit. And while it's charging, the amber light on the battery will be flashing. And when it's completely charged, it'll glow steady. And at that point, you're ready to use it. So do that before you uh, put it on the mill and start using it. Your battery will last longer and you'll be happier. Now, you check it out here. You turn it on and here you can see the green light so the unit is on. Amber light over the battery tells us full charge. If that amber light is flashing while you're using the unit on the sawmill, that means your battery is about to go dead and you need to either recharge the battery or drop in that replacement that you're keeping in your toolbox. Speaking of chargers, I got this charging unit uh, on Amazon for 27 bucks. I think you could probably get them on eBay. Came with two extra batteries, which is great. And when you keep the batteries in your toolbox, uh, just put them in a Ziploc bag or find some way to make sure that they don't short out against any metal. Turn on, and you got up fast and slow speed. There's 
carriage lift. And I'm going to start out on the slow speed on the feed. Go over to the rabbit side. You're back in a hurry. Okay, we have action. That's great. All right, we're ready to fill the hydraulic reservoir. And you want to fill it to within about two inches of the top of the reservoir. And it comes to about three gallons. And this is Dexron uh, type automatic transmission fluid. And when you fill it, you find it's easier to fill if you pour off from the top. Let's see how we're doing. Looking pretty close. So we'll just put in a little more, but not much. Looks like we are about to here. I'm going to call that good. Just put a little gas in there. I use ethanol free premium in all my small engines. Okay, there's an oil filler on each side. I think this side is a little easier to get to. And it takes about a little over a half quart to fill it. And there may already be oil in it, so we'll check. And yeah, it's already full. There's no dipstick. I guess you just fill it until it reaches the uh, top of that lip right there. And put the cap back on so it stays put. That was easy. Ignition on. Fuel line open. Choke closed. Let's see what it does. And we have engine start. Now we'll open the choke, adjust the throttle, and it'll take just a minute to warm up before it's ready to go. And there goes the log lifter. The hydraulics will be more responsive once the air works out of the system. The turner lift puts stress on the hydraulic lines to the turner motor when it's in the up position. So I'm going to reroute those lines to fix that. And everything else checks out. No hydraulic leaks. So I'll just reroute the lines to the log turner and it'll be ready to go. Field test. 
Well, it's one thing to watch the hydraulics operate on the building site, but let's see what it does with a real log. This black oak log weighs around 1,200 pounds. The log lifter picks it up like it's a mere toothpick. The log turner works great, too, once you get the hang of it. You can turn the log in either direction and get it exactly where you want it. Tow rollers can pick up either end of the log or both ends at once with no problem. The clamps will save a lot of time and effort, too. The wireless remote controls the throttle, carriage lift, and the carriage feed. Looks, looks like everything checks out, and I am ready to start sawmilling. So whether you're adding hydraulics to your Norwood sawmiller, just thinking about it, I hope this video helps.